by the time I'm 21 years old, I'm you know making $10 million a year. So my point is, every time you screw up, you can learn from it and turn it into a positive. That's always what I did. It's the C-A-T-C-H, we catching up. 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 We catching up with Mark. Oh, yeah. What's up, buddy? Listen, that's a big technology uh, accomplishment for us today. We I'll tell you, to we, every time we accomplish it, whoever I'm talking to is very proud of themselves because honestly- I'm definitely proud of myself. Sure. The, be- the, the beauty is, is if it didn't work, life will go on, um, thankfully, and uh, we can just chalk it up to technology's fault. But it worked, and I'm very happy to see you, and I feel like I haven't seen you in person in such a long time. It's kind of sad. I definitely miss you. It was, I, I think I haven't seen you since February, and that feels like about five decades ago, so it's good to see you. It really does. And in that time, congratulations on the new addition to the Rubin family. She's coming home from the hospital tomorrow. Romy Rubin, excited for her to come home. I'm got really excited Sixers for her. Gear, gear, got some Sixers gear to put her in right away. We're going to get her rep in uh, basketball I'm sure. coming back. Fanatics, she's, she's ready to go. She's ready to represent. Immediately promotional onesies. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. By Fanatics. The Instagrams will be blowing up with the onesie selfies in, in no time for a three-day-old. She's making sure every, <laughs> six, every baby in Philadelphia is going to be ready to be in Sixers onesie. She's promoting strong. Joel will be very proud. Absolutely. <laughs> so listen, we have about 30 minutes together. I know you're busy. And, I, and, and you know, first and foremost, um, you know, it's, it's amazing what you're doing now, but always in this kind of thing, and just to, to explain a little bit of like why I'm even bothering doing this, is that, you know, I've been, I was sitting around during quarantine and I've been feeling so, you know, lucky and fortunate that I've got good advice from lawyers or I had good advice from doctors and I can hear from titans of industry like yourself who are navigating a very difficult time. And I wanted to share that perspective with people. Now, beyond that, I'm most interested and always have been in the journey of people like yourself, people that didn't come from the silver spoon and certainly weren't given everything on a silver platter where they just took over their family business or whatever. And not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm really always interested. And I think people that I always talk to about my own story, how do you wind up being in the restaurant business? How do you wind up getting into restaurants that have 500 seats and then in multiple states? And it's a fun story to tell, and people seem genuinely interested. So after talking about myself for the only thing that I've been talking about for the last few years, I want to know always, how the hell do you go from a 12-year-old sitting in the basement of your parents' house and had an idea to running one of the larger corporations in America and certainly a multi-billion dollar company, becoming a billionaire yourself, which, by the way, is, is an incredible achievement that only a few have really accomplished in the whole world. But aside from the money, What's that journey and what was that passion and where it came from? So if you don't mind, before we get into the most amazing things that you're working on today, the All In Challenge and some of the other charitable as well as reforming our, our laws, literally in America, uh, for the better, where, how do you get to where you are that you're able even to be able to do that? So if you don't mind me kicking it off with saying, okay, so you're 12 years old and you're in your parents' basement and you come up with what idea? which quickly sort of transpired as we go along. Obviously, you could talk for 10 hours about it. Yeah, look, for me, I think you're kind of, you're either born with an entrepreneurial gene or you're not. And, you know, Mark, I know you well. You were born with the gene. And, you know, a lot of people have it, but they don't use it. But then sometimes it just comes out. You know, for me, I wasn't really good at anything as a kid. I was a terrible student. I was a terrible athlete. The only thing I was good at was work, and I always loved to work. So, you know, I started businesses from literally when I was eight years old. I was selling baseball cards door to door. I was, you know... When it would snow, I would go out and sell the snow shoveling and have five kids working for me. I'd sell vegetable seeds door to door. So I did start a ski tuning shop in my parents' basement because I was a skier. You know, I right. loved to ski. And I started this little ski tuning shop. And, and, you know, the biggest thing for me, I was just, I never had fear. And so I always just went after whatever my idea was. And by the way, a lot of times it worked. And a lot of times I failed miserably. But I learned from that experience. So started with a ski shop in my parents' basement when I was 12 years old. How important and, to you, by the way, how important is it to you to learn at an early age to fail? If you're, if you're not failing, you're not doing enough things. Because I fail all the time. I was just doing a Zoom two hours ago, and I was you know, talking to uh, potential partners about something we were working on. I was telling them about all the different failures I've had. Failures are great, so long as you learn from them and use them to make yourself better. Every time I fail, I take something away from that to make, make myself better for what I do next. And so to me, I think it's, you know, it's no different than in 
sports or, you know, you, you know, you, you got to learn from your failures. You've got to use all these to kind of motivate yourself. Sure. Um, so for me as a kid, um, you know, I had the ski shop in my parents' basement. And then, you know, I kind of, you know, I started with a little ski tuning shop, you know, little, a few thousand dollars, in, you know, when I was 12 years old. And then a year later, there was a bunch of ski shops where it didn't snow the previous season. They had all this excess inventory. I literally started saying to ski shops, hey, can I borrow some of your inventory? I'll pay you as I, as I sell it. And literally a 13-year-old, I did $25,000 in right. business. This is before you knew the word consignment. I didn't know what consignment was, but I was consigning everything. And it was, right. by the way, that could have been my most profitable business year ever when I was 13, because I had no overhead, I had yeah. no employees, and yeah. I was literally making 50% profit on everything I was selling. You so were I essentially did. a salesman, but but keeping, you know, whatever you whatever you made above. Yeah. yeah, so I was like 13 years old, I did $25,000 in business. I, I made, you know, $12,500, and then the year later, I went to my parents, I said, hey, I found this little ski shop. It's eight hundred dollars a month to rent. I want to open a ski shop, and I actually, you know, the one thing I needed for my parents was to co-sign the lease because I was fourteen, and right. they co-signed the lease for me, thankfully. And this is and, in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, it's a suburban Philadelphia. I opened a ski shop. I did one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars when I was fourteen years old in the ski business. Yeah, and and then my first failure came within two years. At sixteen years old, I'm doing a half a million dollars in business the previous year. And now it doesn't snow. And if you're in the ski business and it doesn't snow, that's not going to be very good for you. No. And so lit literally, um, end of the ski season, I had about $100,000 of inventory. Mm -hmm. I had split a Porsche 50-50 with a friend of mine that I put about $20,000 into. <laughs> I had $200,000 of, of bills. And um, I was going bankrupt. And literally, the sheriff would show up at my parents' house every day to serve me with a new lawsuit. I probably got sued a hundred times in the spring of the year I was 16 years old. For what? So I not thought paying, I was, for not paying yeah, the bills? Yeah, because I didn't have the money to pay the bills. Now, now were your parent, now when, when that happens, right, like were your parents still supportive of you and saying this is a good lesson or were they freaking out and pissed off that you screwed everything up? Uh, I think they were freaking out and it was time for me to go back to school and that mm -hmm. was it. It was like I tried this thing. It was an experiment. It didn't work and Literally, like, I remember this woman, like it was yesterday, this, this sheriff showed up every morning at my parents' house before I went to high school, and she would serve me with the daily lawsuits. And I would, like, give Scary. her a hey. I'd say, hey, what's up? How are you? Kind of, I'd sign for my lawsuits. And then I would, um, I would literally, you know, go to high school. Now, and, when this um, happens, are you scared? Are you discouraged? Are you feeling like, all right, I'm never going to do something like that. I'm just going to get a safe job and, and, and live my life differently? Or were you annoyed and motivated to figure out what went wrong and fix it and come back stronger? I was, I was un at 16 years old, being $200,000 in debt, probably mm -hmm. being sued 100 times. Mm -hmm. I was unfazed. Great. Literally and unfazed. That, and there's and a so, big, and, big lesson in that, isn't there? But, I mean, but here's a, the, at, at that age. But here's the best lesson. So now I hire a bankruptcy lawyer, and I'm mm -hmm. ready to go bankrupt. And um, the bankruptcy lawyer says to me after like the third or fourth meeting, by the way, how old are you? I thought I was like maybe 20, 21, 22. I tell the bankruptcy lawyer, actually, I'm only 16. He gets all of the, um, he gets all of the um, people I owe money together. And he ends up saying, look, you know, Mr. Rubin's not really a mister. He's actually 16. And they said, well, you know, now that you're not even old enough to incur debt, um, we'll be willing to settle your debts for 18 cents of the dollar. I pay without like going bankrupt. Without going bankrupt. And so now for $38,000, I can get out of, out of this, this, this debt. And this is the first time I actually, I'd never you know, borrowed a penny from my parents. I'd ask them to co-sign just because they weren't, I wasn't 18 for the lease. Yeah. And $38,000 was a tremendous amount of money to anybody. And certainly $38,000 was a ton of money, yeah. um, you know, whatever, 30 years ago. And, you know, my dad said to me, I will lend you the money on one condition. You have to agree that you're going to shut the business down and you're going to go to college. So of course I agree. But then a few weeks later, a little problem arises. Mm -hmm. And another ski shop went bankrupt. And when the ski shop went bankrupt, they had $200,000 of inventory that got auctioned off for $18,000. And I bought it. Yeah. My problem was I didn't have the money to pay for it. Uh -huh. So I went back to my dad. I said, Dad, I need to borrow $18,000 more. He looked at me and said, like, are you out of your – he was basically like, are you out of your freaking mind? Like, yeah. zero chance. So I started going neighbor by neighbor, and I found a neighbor who said, I'll lend you the $18,000, but you have to pay me back $1,000 a week interest. I'm like, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. I could borrow this 18000 1000 a week interest. And um, <laughs> I literally borrowed the money. And I went through the yellow pages to find other ski shops I could wholesale to. And within three weeks, I had sold 
like twenty two, twenty three thousand dollars of inventory. So you, but only so sold, you, sold you, like you took a loan from someone for eighteen thousand dollars. It would cost you fifteen to fifty two thousand dollars a year. Is that about that's, the math? That's a hundred percent right. But in three okay. weeks, I paid all the money back. It still Great. had ninety percent of the inventory, okay. and that me almost going bankrupt, settling my debts, literally buying someone else's merchandise when they did go bankrupt, got me into the closeout business. By the time I was twenty one years old. I was doing $150 million a year buying and selling excess sneakers and ski equipment. So the reason I tell you this story is great success at 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Abysmal failure. I'm done. I'm out of business. I'm going back to school. I'm not going to focus mm -hmm. on anything but you know high school and college. And then I find somebody else who goes bankrupt. And that got me into the business. By the time I'm 21 years old, I'm you know making $10 million a year. So my point is every time you screw up, you can learn from it and turn it into a positive. That's always what I did. Well, you really took that, you know, that failure. And instead of running from it, you went all in and, you know, and leaned in to all in. Uh, you leaned in and double down, triple down, quadruple down um, into something that you believe fundamentally could work. You understood why it would work and why it, why it didn't work that particular year. Now, if you had no snow for the next three years, would you have gone bankrupt three times over? No, because I learned a lot of lessons. By almost going bankrupt, I realized, actually, maybe you should start paying your bills instead of buying half of a Porsche. Maybe you shouldn't live like, you know, you're doing great when you're not doing great. I, it, it humbled me. And the there humbling experience was great for me. And so I learned a ton from it. And I think, you know, if I go through my life, I have had so many near-death experiences in business where I thought I was done. And in every one of those near-disaster experiences or disasters, I've learned and grown from and turned it into something more positive. And that is, honestly, I think that's the fundamental consistency that I see amongst successful entrepreneurs where they, you know, A, they've pivoted early, they learn from their mistakes, they continued going, but throughout their entire career, they've almost lost it all multiple times. For sure. And if you don't kind of go that route, of course, we always talk to the people that didn't lose it all, but we know people that have lost it all and have come right back. So it's not like they always dodge the bullet. Right. Definitely. They, they, you can you can actually get shot and come back in business. You just have to be smart about it and, 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 and be unique. Now, what brings me to fanatics, what I think um, is super interesting about fanatics um, is, you know, we're in the world of Amazon domination, especially in the tchotchke clothing business, which I would say a lot of it is licensed from other small groups of individuals that sell on Amazon or whatever. How did you wind up taking a, an idea like making clothing with sports labels on it, taking it into your side of the world versus say the NBA side. Like, why isn't the NBA doing it all? Why are you doing it all? I never really understood that. And yeah. then how the, how the, how, how, why is that uniqueness so important to the fact that you compete with Amazon in a way that they cannot? So I have a fundamental belief and I've had it since my old company that eBay bought in 2011, worked with the biggest retailers and biggest brands in the world, helping them to run the e-commerce business. And watching how good of a company Amazon was from 1999 to 2011, I had the firm belief then that if you weren't highly differentiated in e-commerce or in retail against mm -hmm. Amazon or Alibaba, you were dead. So my belief was always you have no chance to win in retail or e-commerce against Amazon or Alibaba if you're not completely differentiated. And so when we started Fanatics, we, we, we had a vision of how do we completely change the fan experience and how do we become vertical like a Lululemon or an H&M or a Zara. So can Let's I just do, pause do, you for yeah. a second? Because this word vertical, omni-channel, yeah. you know, these are words, uh, v-commerce, come up when I, when I hear your sort of stories. Can you explain to people, what does that even mean to be vertical or to be v-commerce versus e-commerce or omni-channel? And I know it's a yeah. great thing and some people know, but what does that mean? Vertical is really simple. So easy? Yeah, vertical is really simple. If you think about H&M, you're buying their products. If you think about Lululemon, you're buying their products. If you think about Best Buy, you're buying other people's products. You're buying a Sony product or a Samsung product. Mm -hmm. And so most of what we sell at the NFL shop or the NBA store, which Fanatics operates, are products that we design, develop, and manufacture. They could be Nike products. They could be Majestic products that we own. They could be lots of different brands. But we, we're vertical, so we have a supply chain that makes the merchandise and we, we, we have a better, because of that, because we're, we're relying on ourselves. we have product that you can't find in other um, marketplaces. So most of the merchandise that we sell, you can't find 
at a um, Department Amazon store. or an Alibaba. And so because of that, uh, we've got a real competitive advantage. But for the fan, the great thing is we've built a supply chain where we can give a fan any player, any colorway, any product. Because, you know, in sports, somebody gets hot, somebody gets cold. Somebody emerges, somebody gets injured. A team gets hot, a team gets cold. So you need yeah. to be able to service the fan for whatever they want. And so it's it's a business model that allows us to be very differentiated because we're selling our own merchandise that you can't commonly find other places. And we make and design a lot of that just like a Lululemon or an H&M does. Now, do you choose not to sell on Amazon because you want to remain exclusive into your retail store and your own e-commerce site? Or is it something that in the future you could wind up allowing them to sell on Amazon? Yeah, we, I mean, sell, on lot, we, we, we sell on lots of marketplaces throughout the world. We sell on Walmart as a marketplace. Mm -hmm. We sell on other marketplaces throughout the world. We have huge respect and admiration from Amazon. I would never say that it's impossible that we would work with Amazon. But right now, we have a really successful model. Um, the company has gone from – when I bought it back from eBay in 2011, it, it did $250 million the previous year. Revenue is going to be about $3.5 billion in revenue next year. So it's growing so that's incredibly a, good. That's a, so more than 10 times. Now, how do you – Which, by the way, isn't enough. We're just getting started, but it's been good growth. I have no doubt. But how do you how do you go from 250 to 3.5 billion in sales in less than 10 years? I mean, is it just uh, using e-commerce more intelligently, yeah. social media, uh, better well, relationship? What is it? What's the well, if you really think about it fundamentally, if you're going to be in any portion of retail, where do you want to be? You want to be in e-commerce because that's where the growth is. OK, number one. So brick and mortar retail each year gets a teeny bit more difficult and each year e-commerce gets bigger. And then we're doing it with the best sports properties in the world. And so we're able to, um, you know, give a fan experience that's highly differentiated that you can't get at most marketplaces or really any marketplaces. And so because e-commerce is growing, because we have this incredible assortment of products from all these great sports properties, the company keeps growing and growing and growing. No, I get it. But it's like everybody agrees with that, right? Like, yeah, e-commerce is where it's at. But just because you're on the Internet selling something in a pretty website and store – does it really come down to having the right product that 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 well, has the highest demand? Yeah, or, well, most people online are yeah, most people online are selling other people's products, so they're mm -hmm. commonly available. If you can go to um, eBay, you can go to Alibaba, you can go to Amazon and just find these products that are commonly available, then you don't have a point of difference. For Lululemon, they they control where you buy that merchandise, and they they have merchandise that and that why does Lululemon grow so much? They make a great product that's highly in demand, and they keep growing because you can only get that product from them. But what's incredible about what you've accomplished is that your product is still other people's product, yet it's your own product. In other words, you're printing Knicks jerseys for Knicks fans. You don't know the Knicks, right? So, like, the fact that you're able to even do that and maintain it in your own well, kind of store. Well, the way, the way to think about it is ESPN's buying rights uh, for sports media, and we buy rights for uh, sports merchandise. And it's really it, – that's the way to think about it. Sure, and I think it's a great way to think about it. My question to you now is – would you say to giving advice to people that want to get into, you know, well, first of all, with this quarantine and with coronavirus and all this shit going on, people are pivoting all over the place because they're like, I don't have a job. What I used to do doesn't even allow me to work there anymore. So a lot of people are sitting on their hands and like twiddling their thumbs thinking real hard. What can I do next? What is an advice that you, what is some advice that you could give to people that are out there that do have an entrepreneurial spirit, but are yeah. literally like, at a loss, like, what do I do? I can't get the rights to something, or could you? Would you advise them to go a certain path to try to do something that's not too labor intensive, not too overhead brick and mortar so, intensive? So I generally feel like everything happens for a reason, including bad things, or if something bad happens, you got to find a way to turn it into a positive. And I think I go through a lot of bad things that have happened to me in my life that we've turned into positives. And so I think it's easier for me to say this. And everyone's going to say, well, Michael, hey, you've been you know, pretty successful. So easier for you to say than to do. But I, I really think, you know, this country is really hurting right now. Uh, mm -hmm. There's tens of millions of people that are unemployed. But maybe for some of those people, so maybe some of those people listening today, that that's an opportunity to figure out how can you – maybe there's a career pivot that you can do. Maybe, you know, you can say, you, you know what, I've done something the same way for a long time. But you know what, the world's changing. And let me figure out how I can turn this into an opportunity so I generally figure out every bad thing, how we can turn it into a positive. I, mean, I was just talking about this with a friend of mine and something bad happened to him. We, we turned it into a real positive. And so I think um, if you just sit back and wait for things to come your way, you're generally not going to get a good outcome versus if you're like, you know what, 
fuck it. I'm going to control my own destiny. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to get a better outcome and I'm going to be unrelenting. Like my best skill set. And, you know, I try to tell people this all the time, but let, let me ask you a question. Mark, what'd you get in your combined SATs? Uh, I think I got a like 10, 20 or something, which for me was amazing because I was a terrible student. I don't know how I got a 10, 20. I thought I'd be under a thousand. Okay. I got a 780 combined. Yeah. Okay. And people look at that, they're like, wait a second, how'd you get a 780 in your SATs? Because what makes me successful, I was a terrible student. Same. I was one of the dumbest, you know, when you think about being book smart, I was as dumb as you get. What I, I was barely read at, a book. Right. I had a great work ethic. And yeah. I had just, I had vision and I had work ethic. And to me, I'm always the person who won't quit. And even if you look at what we just did with the All In Challenge, even, you know, from the beginning of April till, um, you know, really the end of May, raising $60 million for people that were in need of, of food. So many other people try to copy what we did and they didn't raise a couple hundred thousand dollars, but we raised $60 million. Why? Because we were unrelenting. If you're unrelenting, that will get you a great outcome. So for me, I always say to people, you know what? Just have good idea and don't quit, period. Of the story. Just you know, keep going after your dream. I'll tell you something. Even yesterday, I was in New York for mm -hmm. a, a hot minute and, and um, I was with um, the CEO of Rock Nation. We walked out of a meeting and someone, I guess, had followed her there and started um, rapping to her. He wanted her to you know, hear his, 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 his rapping capabilities. I looked at him when he got finished. I said, I love your spirit, man. Like, it's great. Like, yeah. this. I just lost your audio. This card. And you, you, oh, there you go. You, I lost your audio for a second. You hear me now? Back. Yeah, yeah, you're back. Yeah. My alarm keeps going off telling me that I should call you, and I can't, if, if I actually turn my alarm off, we're, we're going we're gonna to lose the live. So I'm, I'm improvising. So we, I every, every, say, every like, time this news comes, we, got, we, got, we, we, we lose the audio for, for a second or so. Okay. It's okay. So, so what I think is beautiful about you, and aside from the business successes, what I think you missed to explain about um, being relentless and all that stuff is that a lot of people have great ideas, but the execution and the actual you know, follow through with those ideas is what 99% of the people don't do. When you're sitting at home thinking, gee, I see there's a problem here with the lack of masks and PPE and, and gowns. Some people identify that problem, complain about it, talk to their friends about it and say, gee, isn't that horrible? Or they say, wouldn't it be nice if I like went and called a few friends that are in the manufacturing business and maybe figured out a way to do it. And then they just don't do it. You, on the other hand, in what, 2017 sort of changed your life, right? In November with Meek Mills, when you're sitting and seeing what he went through with probation. Um, and you sit there once again as someone who's like just a guy who has a friend in a problem. He happens to be famous, but quite frankly, famous or not famous, it happens every day. And you decide to do what? Or you're sitting there realizing there's PPE problems and you decide to do what? And then you think, oh, gee, there's people that are all hungry. Well, wouldn't it be nice if I called one of my famous friends? And by the way, they're famous, which has certain power. And with that power comes the ability to do things that for the positive, like raise $60 million, which you never probably would have imagined that moment to happen. What happened to you in 2017 that put you on this path of charity work, reform, um, you know, the Reform Alliance, which I think you formed two years later, and then ultimately to the All In Challenge, which has reaped such incredible reward. Yeah, you, of, you know, for me, for me, if I'm just being completely candid, up until November 2017, I always gave money away to, you know, people I cared about who needed help with different charities, or I was always charitable. Including but, me, but, including me. I called you the other day and said, hey, I'm working with the Covenant House, which is, you know, homeless youth, and it's a huge problem in California and throughout the country. And you said, great, I'm going to give you $50,000 and hung up on me. I mean, it know, was like, you know. And by the way, that's working. the way Thank I, you. I, I that, you're very welcome. But that's the way I acted up until 2017. That's exactly the way I acted. It's, it's do I like you? Do I believe in what you need the money for? And it's a quick yes, and I move on. Then something happened. I had a good friend of mine, Meek, who kept explaining to me all the legal problems he was having with this you know, crazy judge, and he kept getting sent back to prison for not committing crimes. And when it happened the fourth time, he said to me, Michael, can you come to court with me? I want you to see what happens. And I thought I was going for like a 15-minute court hearing. He'd been, you know, everyone knows the story by now. He popped a wheel yeah. on a motorcycle and, you know, broke up a fight in an airport. There were no charges in either case. And I go to court with him. And when I see him get to sent to prison for two to four years for not committing a crime, I had this, you know, just out of body reaction 
But here's the most important thing of this whole story. Yeah. You know, the CEO of Rock Nation, Jay-Z, we all fought together to get him out of prison. But the much bigger thing was I learned during that experience that this is something that happens to so many people that they just they get unfairly caught within the criminal justice system. And that's when we said we need to do something about it. And that's when Meek and Robert Kraft and Jay-Z and myself and our other great partners said we're going to start the Reform Alliance to help change the probation laws. And by the way, just yesterday, the Senate in Pennsylvania approved our probation bill, which now needs to go through the House and then have the governor sign. But that's going to affect, you know, more than 100,000 people's lives. So here's my point to this. We took a really negative. Meek went to prison for five and a half months for not committing the crime. And then we turned that into a positive by starting the reform alliance to help, you know, more than a million people get out of the system that shouldn't be in it, which will help tens of millions of people when you look at their family. And that's turned a negative into a positive. Then think about the pandemic. This pandemic comes along. And you know what? You're right. It is the truth be told. Ideas are dime a dozen. You give mm-hmm. me give me four drinks and I'll throw a hundred great ideas at you. My brain just starts going. Mm-hmm. But you have to execute them. Yeah. And you know what, what? What we've generally had is good ideas and an incredible work ethic. I'm still one of you know. It's my single best skill set is my work ethic. And when I come up with an idea, I'm unrelented to do it. And I'll tell you one of the cool things about going through this quarantine. One of the cool things about the pandemic. When I came up with the idea to start the All In Challenge, I said to my daughter who's now 14. And I said to my girlfriend. I kept saying every day, because I knew the second I came up with the idea, it was going to be huge. I kept saying, guys, remember all these conversations you had at dinner. You heard me on the phone with people. This is going to be something really cool. And then we launched it two weeks later. We raised $60 million. It becomes like, you know, probably the biggest charitable movement since, you know, um, you know in, in, in probably the decade. Um, and, and, and they got to see that happen. You see, good idea, great work. I think you can make something happen. You know, it doesn't go from just A to Z, though. There's the amount of relationship you, relationships that you've built over the years. It's the credibility that you've had with people that you, you follow through, that they believe in what you're doing, and then your ability to call them and literally say, I need you. And then people like Kevin Hart, people like Tiger Woods, people like, who, I mean, the list went on and on and on, came up with these in- incredible experiences. Um, do you stop there or do you continue with this? Because I think that the experience um, value that people are putting on things like being in a movie, um, you know, when you said to Kevin Hart, what, Hey man, can we work on this and maybe donate X, Y, Z. And he said, up donate X, Y, Z. I'll make these people a movie star that continued and continued, but by no means does it need to end. Where do you think this goes? And, and what do you, what do you think, you know, would be next for that? Yeah, for me, I've always been good at making money. That's like, you know, as a business person, that's the skill set I was born. I wasn't born with, you know, athletic genes. I wasn't born with uh, scholastic genes. I was born with just common sense and making money. And so for me, that's all I did up until uh, the thing happened with me. And then we started the Reform Alliance, which to me, like such gratifying to be able to help people in that way that you don't think of. So so what, can you tell me a little bit? Yeah, let let me just finish the thought. With the All in Challenge, we originally just thought about, hey, I came up with the idea. We, we literally we were live two weeks later. But n- now you realize we've got this platform to help any giant world issue that comes up. So hopefully there's never another issue. But there will be, of course. And we'll bring the All-In Challenge out again. And you know, I think we raised $60 million in, in the, in, 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 just for helping people to eat during the pandemic. And I think bigger than that was we created this incredible platform. And that's you know something that I'm so excited about. And now we have both the Reform Alliance, which is working to get a minimum of a million people out of the system, off of probation and parole. Um, in the next three and a half years. And we have the all-in challenge that just raised $60 million. And I'm more proud of that than anything I could do in business. Yeah, that's what I really want to understand. What is the, what kind of more details about what the Reform Alliance really is? And I understand it has to do with probation and getting people out of the prison system that are unnecessarily convicted or put back in for minor, for minor infractions. But just being on probation in our yeah, country so here's pe- in here's and of itself is a sentence. Yeah, here's what people don't understand. There's 6.7 million people in the criminal justice system in America um, 2.2 million are in prison and jail, 4.5 million on probation and parole. Mm-hmm. Of the 4.5 million on probation and parole, if you did this in a logical way, I think the number should probably be a million and a half people. There's probably, there's probably 3, million too many pe- 3 million too many people on probation and parole. And so what we're working to do is change the laws on a state-by-state basis that would put limitations on how long you can be on probation and parole, that would let people uh, take time off for good time behavior, and most importantly, if you don't commit a crime, they don't let you go back to prison. So what I watched is a good friend of mine go to prison four times for not committing a crime. And so if, Mark, you were on probation and you can afford to pay your, your fines, you shouldn't be going to prison for that. 
if yeah. you smoke weed and you have a dirty urine, by the way, weed's even become illegal. Like the biggest thing people go get technical probation violations for is missing their probation appointment, or drugs, not right. paying their fines, or testing positive for marijuana. Right. You should never go to prison for any of this. Yeah, agreed. And, and so we're working to change the laws and, on a state-by-state state basis. And when will the bill that you just got approved get what, – what's the timeline here for things to progress, do you think? So Yeah, so never quick enough. Um, yeah, of course. But we had a big victory yesterday, thanks to everyone in the uh, Pennsylvania Senate who worked to create the bill. It now needs to go to the House and then the governor. Governor, I think that's going to get done in the next you know few months. And that's, that's local. Big, that's local to Philadelphia. State of Pennsylvania. Uh, state of Everything Pennsylvania. Is, so, Right, the alarm, the alarm. Wait, wait. Wait, okay. Percent of the people on the criminal justice system, yeah, 90% of the people on the criminal justice system, um, it's at the state level, not the federal level. So people always say, hey, you know, can the government do something about it nationally? The answer is only for their 10%. 90% is at the state level. And so we're changing the laws on a uh, state-by-state basis. And the two biggest states we're working in right now is California and Pennsylvania. And by the way, Pennsylvania is where this whole thing was inspired from because we watched, you know, you know, my buddy, Meek yeah. Bill, you know, who went through all of this in Pennsylvania. And by the way, that is the best example ever of turning a negative into a positive. Here's a guy who went to prison for not committing a crime and came out and we're doing something about it. And that's what I talk about. You got to you know, take your failures and take your L's and turn them into W's. I think it's amazing. And I'm really glad that you're, you know, able to do that. And, and I think the underlying uh, point here is exactly that. It was just taking a negative and making it into a positive, which I think that we all – literally worldwide, especially nationwide, um, really need to look at today as, although it is a challenge and it is a negative of what's going on, that we all need to really figure out how to turn it into that positive. And, and it could be small wins, right? You're, you're talking about something that's huge, but at the same time, the small win is in the state you know, of Pennsylvania, working over to California, getting into New York, and hopefully that that sets the precedence for the change that needs to be made as a beginning. Well, by the way, I'll tell you something. What, what I think we can get done this year in California, Pennsylvania alone will not be small wins. There actually be really big wins, and they'll have a big difference. And we made a goal to get a million people out of the system uh, in five years. We started that January 2019, and I think we'll get that done with our original five-year goal. And I think this is going to be a big year for us, so I'm excited. But at the end of the day, ideas are easy. you got to get the results. So people need to hold us accountable to doing what we said we were going to do, and I think we're going to. Well, that's incredibly inspiring. And you're right, it is a huge win, even though when I say small, I mean, for everybody that's watching or, or thinking about their own personal issues right now of, of whatever negativity is, their small win is still a win, you know, and it's not necessarily changing the whole world, but even just changing the, you know, for the better for your own family and your own situation is where you have to look for it. You know, it's like, where can I turn this negative to a positive? What else is there to do? Absolutely. Well, you're certainly an inspiration, my friend. Um, and I really appreciate your time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you and the new baby and hopefully going somewhere fun in the near future I, because, I, I, boy, I, do I need it. I, lo- I look forward to seeing you. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you catch LA. I look forward to seeing you catch New York. I look forward to being in Europe with you. I look yeah. forward to giving you a big hug. I look forward to social distancing being over. So all these things. It's great to see you. I love that you're doing this. This is how Same. we all learn from Same each other you. is just by telling good stories. Exactly. And uh, I'll talk to you soon, my brother. No, I thank you. And thank you for all your support over these years. And even just recently for Covenant House, I really appreciate it. Back at you. Love you, brother. Thank you. I'll see you soon. All right. So that was Michael Rubin, a gem of a human being. And, and, and like he said, he's just someone that, you know, doesn't just have the idea, but actually executes it and doesn't just think of ways to do it, but actually does it and doesn't mind calling upon his friends to help him do it. You know, it's like, that's what we need to do is just, you know, rely on community and, each other to help wherever we can, you know, push our agenda forward.